Hi everyone and welcome to my presentation. I am Gaëtan Renault and I am glad to be there today to talk about my master research projects on physics informed neural network. I work at Laboratory for Multiscale Mechanics with Professors Frédéric Gosselin from Polytechnic Montreal and Sébastien Wood from Laval University and we are supported by a consortium on hydraulic machines regrouping manufacturers and operators through the TR Francis project. And today, let's talk about how to reconstruct efficiently a periodic flow using low quality and sparse data. To illustrate our problem, let's have a look at an engineering competition. In Formula 1, one of the major issues is to get a good correlation between the data that we collect on the track, the one that we collect in a wind tunnel, and the one from numerical simulations. All these three data are very interesting. They have different levels of accuracy, of precision, of sparsity, level of uh, representativity. And also, they are all very expensive. And in the end, what we want is to get a good estimation of the downforce, to get reduced order models of the cooling of the engine, of the tire degradation. And these problems are very similar to the one we encountered in the energy sector. In hydraulic machines, we'd like to have good estimation of the fatigue of the turbines using onboard sensors, for instance. And one way of doing this is by using physics-informed neural networks. Before we go into further details, just remind that the physics-informed neural networks approximate any physical quantity as a function of space and time coordinates. And it relies on the basis of a neural network, which is a universal approximator of a function. So let's take the input of a function, which is a vector, and in that case, let's take just x1, x2, two scalars. And let's do an affine transformation by multiplying these two scalars by a, a matrix w1 and a vector, and adding a vector v1. <coughs> And let's do it again, but that time let's take a nonlinear function sigma of our first row. For instance, we could take the hyperbolic tangent of every scalar here, or a sine, or any function that brings a slight amount of nonlinearity. And if we stop there, this output would look a lot like a Galerkin method. But in a neural network, we can do that as many times as we want, so let's do it once again, and then obtain our output with the last uh, affine transformation. So what we did there is to construct an explicit function q of coordinates x1 and x2. And now we'd like to interpret this value. What could it represent? For instance, we could like q to represent or to approximate this field, this flow. And it could be a passive scalar, it could be a component of velocity, the pressure, lots of things. And to make sure that q approximates well this phenomenon, we have to build a loss function that we will minimize. So, this last function in the physics informed neural networks is composed of two terms. A term that comes from the data and another that comes from prior knowledge. So, the data part is a, in fact a fitting error. We know some measurements of Q at several locations, x1 and x2, and then we output this value at, of the neural network at this location and we compare it. We can do the square difference of the Q and the data and then we minimize this, uh, this distance. On the other part, the knowledge, uh, the knowledge part it comes from uh, prior information on the uh, behavior of Q, of our, uh, our, our scalar. And this can be partial differential equations in several cases in nature. For a flow, it could be the stock equations. And what we can do is compute the residuals of these equations and minimize them in average. So it's the second part of the loss. And we can minimize both these terms in the meantime. And to do that efficiently, we will tune the parameters of our neural networks. So if we remind all these neural networks is defined by the scalar coefficient in the matrix W and in the vectors B. And all these scalar coefficients, to tune them efficiently, we can do gradient descent. Because in today's machine learning library, we have a powerful tool which is um, automatic differentiation. So all this is a symbolic graph of operation, so we can do the derivatives of every quantity with respect to any other. So the derivation of the loss with respect to every scalar in the matrices and vectors, um, let us do a gradient descent, which is a fast way of doing optimization. But also we can do the exact derivation of the output of the neural network with the input. So it helps us doing exactly computing exactly the residual of the partial differential equation very quickly. So it's a, it's a well suited for a physics informed neural networks. And if we have a look uh, into more details on how to compute these two terms, we, need, we will see that we need two sample points. So if we take a phenomenon that is two dimensional in, in space 
x n1 and y n1 dimension in time, which is the, here this uh, dimension, um, we have to sample penalization points into the whole domain. So, for instance, here I think there is 10,000 points that are sampled into the three dimension. And then we will compute the residual at each point and minimize it in average. It's quite easy because we can just randomly sample points in not a big deal. The second part, the fitting error, it will depend mainly on how your data is distributed in time and space. In some cases, like when you do PIV measurements in the flow, you can obtain data that are densely uh, distributed in uh, your uh, space. And so you have a small area in which you do not have any information and you have to interpolate between them using the neural networks and the physical regularization. So usually this is a simple problem. And in some cases, the data is uh, more spaced. And here you got an example which uh, represents uh, time signals uh, measurements at several locations. And sometimes these locations are uh, spaced a lot between them. If you look at this point, this uh, array of points and this array of points, you get a large empty zone between them, and it's more complicated to interpolate in that zone using the physical regularization. So we did the optimization of these neural networks of these two terms using optimizer from TensorFlow. And, uh, and you also use prior dictionary to enforce the boundary condition. If we have a look back at the flow we wanted to represent, uh, we can note something. There is a, a property in that flow, which is periodicity. And in that case, model analysis have provided powerful tools to help reduce the complexity of this representation. So if we look at a numerical simulation representing this phenomena in, in a more simple case, it's a vortex shading uh, of, of an incompressible flow around a cylinder at three knots equal to 100. Here you can see the horizontal component of the velocity, u. And this information is three-dimensional information. It's two dimensions in space and one in time. So it's quite heavy to store and to approximate by neural networks. And what we can do is to do the Fourier decomposition of these signals, of this information. So we can take the average in time here, then the first frequency, the second, the third, etc. And in theory, this sum goes to infinite. So we should have an infinite number of modes. But in practice, only a few number of modes is, uh, is, is needed to uh, good, uh, good reconstruction of this flow. And with only these three oscillating modes, we can have a reconstruction with an error that is approximately around 1%, which is quite acceptable. So that's what we did to enforce uh, this simplicity. So we, we make sure that the neural networks approximate these mode shapes only as a function of x and y coordinates. And we choose the number of mode shapes and we input the uh, fundamental frequency. And then we recover this three-dimensional information by doing the model sum directly into the neural networks. So you can see here the model sum, and that's directly what is done here. And from what we have said, it should be far easier to approximate 2D function instead of three-dimensional function. And we wanted to test that, and to do so, we did several trainings and of a classic pin and a modal pin in the, with the same training time and the same computational resources. And we did that for several ne networks that have different numbers of degrees of freedom. So the number of degrees of freedom is the number of scalars that you have to tune in your neural networks. It's represented here. And it's a bit an analogy to the number of elements you would have in an adaptive, in an adaptive mesh. And at the end of the training, we look at the validation loss here, which quantifies <coughs> the precision of the representation of uh, our phenomenon. So what we can see there is that the classic pins, which approximate um, our phenomena as a function of space and time, has a precision that increases with the number of degrees of freedom. And it's not the case with a modal pin. We have one mode here, one oscillating mode, two modes, and three modes. So it shows a bit of robustness because you don't necessarily want that your, your uh, results depends a lot on the number of degrees of freedom. You would like to have uh, something that can be converged quite quickly and that is stable. And that's the case here. You can see that once your second mode is converged, um, the, the result does not depend a lot on the uh, number of parameters you have. So you have better to increase the number of modes instead of the numbers of degrees of freedom. Also, you can see that only with one mode or two modes, we got a very good approximation compared to what we can do with a classic pin with the same uh, number of degrees of freedom. And uh, so this means that from a practical point of view, we will be able to do this uh, reconstruction of the flow with uh, uh, lighter neural networks. So do it very, uh, do it faster 
and also maybe look at problems that are more complicated, like because we have a fewer number of degrees of freedom, so we can optimize more complex things. To give an example, <coughs> let's have a look at our four-dimensional one in a wind tunnel. If we see that video, we can see that there is a, a probe, which in fact several probes on the comb, that is moving just after the front right tire. So it records data at several locations, but at each location you have a delay. And this delay can make things quite complicated in the end. And we wanted to know if uh, we are able to solve that problem. So we look back at our numerical simulation of a vortex shading, and uh, we simulate a probe that would extract time signals of velocity at several locations depicted with the black points in, in this picture. And we did the assumption that this probe, this virtual probe, was not aware of the delay at which it started to record. And that's how we represent it in the data space. So you get the lines in the time dimension, which are, which are the time signals. And all these signals are shifted by an unknown delay, which is represented with this red arrow. And to retrieve this delay, we use as many variables as we add uh, time signals, so 40 variables here, into the graph of operation of TensorFlow. And we optimize these variables in the meantime that we did the optimization of the neural network. And in the end, it works pretty well. If we have a look back at uh, the delay that we artificially added in the orange bars at the several location and the one we found with the blue bars, there's a lot of location where the delay is well retrieved. And to see it more clearly, we can have a look at the absolute difference at all those locations. So all the locations in the wake of the cylinder where the flow is very unsteady, the, the, the retrieve delay has an error of 1% uh, of relative error, which is very good. And there are still some locations where the delay is not well retrieved, but to, we can understand this because there is a, um, the, the flow is steady at, nearly steady at these locations, and uh, there is a lack of phase information, and, and it does not prevent from reconstructed well the flow. If we compare the reconstructed flow with the uh, exact data from simulation, it fits quite well. So to sum it up, uh, we propose to enforce uh, truncated Fourier decomposition directly into the modal network like you can see here. It shows a great gain in efficiency, and this could address any problem in continuum physics that depicts this kind of periodicity, either in time or space. And in the end, we, we, we saw that it could help us uh, tackle problems that are inspired by uh, experimental limitations. I'd like to thank you, and I'd be pleased to answer any question, either during the live session or by email. Thank you.